Okay, <coughs> brother. You know, the, this point on courage, do you think when the sorcerers changed their opinion, that was also courage? So just to repeat the question, the brother's asking, when the sorcerers uh, changed their opinion, was that also courage? Um, Jazakallah for the question. Yes, exactly, it was. And the point that I'm making with the and the reason I included the sorcerer's example is that fundamentally and ultimately, even if a man was ignorant of anything and all he knew was Allah, that's all he knew, yeah? This person would be dynamic. He'd be amazing. He'd be fearless. His iman would act as a, a, a barrier and a shield against anything. And what the magicians had at that moment was they had the sweetness of iman. And that's what gave them the courage to be able to deal with the threats of Fir'aun. Because that's the only thing that would help you in that situation. Because if you are somebody who believes this life is the only life, imagine, imagine you believe this life is your only life. The pleasures that you get in this life are the only pleasures that you're going to receive. And that there's no accounting, and that there's no punishment, and there's nothing afterwards. Why would you do anything different to what everyone, than what everyone else is doing? Why do we behave in a certain way? We behave in the way we behave because we believe in Allah. We believe in the last day. We're going to go back to Allah. We're going to be accounted for every atom's weight of good and every atom's weight of bad. If you now remove that, then we would act completely different. So these magicians, they knew that they would be resurrected and that they would go to Allah. And that was sufficient for them to realize that Fir'aun was false and what Musa came with is the truth. Yeah? And this courage is what we need to emulate. Now there's another point as well on a slight separate topic. It's about change. Sometimes we think change takes a long time. Sometimes we think, oh, um, a year, two years, ten years, you know, it can take a lot of time. But actually, your habits might take time to change. But change can happen instantly. And there's numerous examples of that. And the magician's example is one of those, where change can happen instantly. It all, all it takes is this to change and you to be convinced of something new. Do you see? The magicians were convinced that Fir'aun was God. Then they came to new information and they were convinced and that's all it took for them to change from the first situation to the second. So to any of you sitting here, any of the sisters or anyone that you know, think, think about it. it. It's not a long process, it's a question of your relationship with Allah and the belief of Allah and the belief of Islam. You see, if you address that and you get that right, then everything comes into place. Any other questions? Yeah, Brother Shah. So the brother is asking, uh, what would be the suggestion for the sisters in Nottingham uh, where they cannot wear the jilbab? Firstly, I, I'm, I'm not sure the situation in every school, and I'm not sure how bad the situation is. I, I know some schools are very dead against it, and, and some schools are not. The, the situation here now is for you to assess this problem now, yeah? and there's many layers to it. First and, first and foremost, before you even look at this issue itself, you need to look at the whole topic of Islam, Islamic practices, and parenting and raising children because this is what it raises it raises that question so for our mothers for our fathers here is how am i giving my islam to my child whether the, ch the child is able to do the end bit at the end is the last part of it but actually he needs to be concerned with that because a lot of the time the parents might be concerned but the child not, might not be do you see so there's a real problem here of parenting and asking yourself how am i giving my islam to my child and how do i make my child concerned about this practice how do I make them worry about this? How do I make them want to do this? How do I uh, empower them and make them confident about this? That's the first stage. The second stage of this is you need to tackle every problem yeah, as it comes. So here the situation might be engagement with schools. It could be looking at alternatives. yeah, Homeschooling, Islamic schooling. yeah. All of those options are open for you. Yeah? So engagement with the school it could be an option if you've got no other option to go to. Yeah? So I know many parents who've gone to schools and have come to an agreement yeah, and made it possible. I know some parents who've chosen to homeschool their children because they knew that it would not be uh, possible. And, and for them, the value of the jilbab outweighed anything in terms of the education that they have. And that takes courage to say that because you're living in a society where you're judged by the educational achievements that your kid has. So if that's jeopardized in, in, in any way, 
other people would look at you and think that's a bit strange so you're sacrificing your child's education so that they can wear a long dress people look at that in a strange way but you need to have the conviction in wait a minute why am i protecting this why am i trying to pre preserve this because it's a command from allah so the answer to the question is that no, it's not as simple as oh I take my child out or I have to homeschool them or I have to send them to an Islamic school. It's about a wider question about engagement and asking yourself, well actually do I have any engagement with the schools that I send them to? What's available in the community? Has anybody else raised this? You know, why am I now only concerned about it? This has actually been an issue for a lot of us. Well, can we collectively gather to address this? Can you see? There's many facets to addressing this other than simply saying oh I can't send them to the school. You see? But yeah. Can I just also add to that? I think uh, brothers and sisters often, especially parents, underestimate uh, what they can do uh, by just engaging with the schools. They automatically assume that they can't do anything about it. And often that's what everyone assumes. So I think all it needs is, again, to be courageous and actually raise the issue with the governors, uh, with the teachers, and see what can be done, inshallah. Uh, I just add something to yeah, that. Inshallah, a lot can be done. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, that, I mean, that's such a beautiful point, which is often we've feel defeated before we've done anything. And that's also a symptom of not having the courage. Yeah? And it's actually also a symptom of being pushed down all the time. Yeah? So if you look at Bani Israel, one of the characteristics that they had was that they were, uh, because of the oppression that they faced, they were a certain way. Yeah? It's like they were accustomed to this low situation, this low level, and they never hoped for anything better. So the brother's given a beautiful piece of advice that is that do not think that there's a way out of this. There is a way out of the situation and you can achieve a lot, but you have to have the ability to engage and not think, well, actually, I'm not going to be successful anyway, so let me just keep my head down. Because remember, in any situation, the easiest thing to do, yeah, the easiest immediate thing to do is not do anything or enjoying in the bad thing. That's the easiest thing to do. So there's a famous uh, narration about um, the Sabbath, right? So um, the children of Israel, the men Israel were told, do not fish on a Saturday. Yeah, famous story. And then what happened? These, uh, <laughs> and to be careful with my words, but what basically what they did was they were told not to, to fish on Saturdays. And they came up with an idea. What did they do? They said, okay, what we'll do is we'll cast our nets out. So we'll catch the fish anyway. And what we'll do is we'll pull them out on Sunday. Yeah. So they were commanded, don't do this thing. They tried to find a way around it. Now, in that situation, there were three groupings of people. There were the people who committed the act. There were the people who watched but didn't say anything. And then there were the people that accounted. And the only ones that were rewarded were who? The ones who actually did something and accounted. So silently watching tyranny, oppression, haram, these type of things, yeah, uh, munkar, is not an acceptable situation. It should worry us and we should want to do something about it. Do you see? So uh, remember this point The easiest thing to do, yes, is to be silent And enjoying bad The hard thing to do is to take action But that's the thing that's obligated Is that for the hashtag? Small question Do you think after 9-11 The courage in the western world From the Muslim community Is getting lower and lower uh, Disappeared So the Sheikh's asking Do you think that after 9-11 The courage in the Muslim community Is getting less and less Inshallah Again, this is an interesting question because, again, take an example, because we're discussing Musa, from the point that I mentioned earlier, is when a, a particular nation, a pe particular people are constantly oppressed and put down, the net effect of that is not normally positive because they develop very negative traits and characteristics, yeah? which is why Allah tells us to look at them. And in Islam, we have this concept of Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, enjoining good and forbidding him for a reason. Is so that we don't fall into the depths of what Bani Israel fell into. Yeah? Now going to the question in terms of confidence, I would say, although the situation looks tough and we've been attacked more than ever before, in an interesting way, uh, interestingly, I would say, the Muslims are coming closer to Islam. And, and, and that is an interesting observation that, you know, even if we were to look at this question superficially, you, you take a snapshot, I don't know, of, some, of Egypt in the 70s or something, yeah? Um, or Turkey or whatever it is You, you see a, a picture of loads of women No hijab, nothing I know it's a very superficial example But then you take a snapshot now Everyone's in hijab and jilbab But Islam is an, under attack now More than ever before But all of a sudden people are Putting on the Islamic dress they want, They're more interested in Islam They're more interested in knowing about Islam Since 2001 they said that There's been more converts to Islam than ever before 
because it shone light onto Islam. So people were interested in Islam. So I'd say, although the challenges have increased, I wouldn't necessarily say that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, lacks courage or confidence. It's just we need to develop it more and more. And we see enough examples where actually we're returning back to Allah, we're returning back to the deen. Look in the UK, there's more interest in Arabic than there's ever before. There's more interest in fiqh courses than ever before. Yeah? So these are positive signs. So we need to nurture these positive aspects and we need to not bury our head under, under the sand and acknowledge the challenges. The challenges of um, the pressure of conforming to the current ideas. Yeah? So it, recently the transgender issue has come where Muslims they must accept uh, gender choices yeah or and previously homosexuality and this being taught in schools that's a challenge right but we have to rise to that yeah so I would say yes um, the challenges have increased but I would say that there's enough positive signs that the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is gaining in confidence and, and and looking to Islam more than ever before. I think inshallah we'll, uh, we'll end there. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, you know, allow us that when our Musa alayhi salam moments come, that we actually uh, have the courage to preserve our identity, inshallah. Can I say Jazakallah hair to Brother Zakaria for the enlightening talk? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a tremendous reward. And can I say Jazakallah hair to all of you for making the time to come and listen attentively? Uh, Sheikh Ismail for allowing the Al Bayan to be used, inshallah. Uh, just a reminder again that our next talk will be on the 17th of February, inshallah. So please put that day in your diary.